a couple minutes after the hour. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, mm -hmm. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I just want to tell you quickly who you'll see on your screen this evening. Um, meanwhile, we would love to know who you are listening. So if you want to in the chat, um, we'd love to hear maybe where you're from or and or a word about what brought you here tonight, what your interest is. I think we have some University of Northwestern students, so maybe in the chat you could tell us what your major is, um, maybe your favorite class or text that you've had at Northwestern. Uh, my name is Natalie Walker, and I'm the manager of college operations here at the Classic Learning Test, or CLT. Uh, we're joined by Dr. Adina Kelly, a professor at University of Northwestern, St. Paul, where she teaches a wide range of classes, including courses on American history, political science, public history, and Western civilization. She's also the director of the Eagles Honors Program and an alumna of the university herself. Uh, so tonight, please put in the chat any question that occurs to you about Ida B. Wells, but also about University of Northwestern. Northwestern. Um, we'll pose some of those questions from the chat at the end of Dr. Kelly's lecture. Um, before our last, uh, introductions. I was wondering, Dr. Kelly, if you could actually talk just for a minute about what brought you, you to UNW first as a student and now as a professor. What do you love there? Yeah, so I initially chose Northwestern because of um, the strong commitment to teaching from a Christian worldview and a really Christ-centered education, but also um, the community and the location. So we are in St. Paul, Minnesota on this beautiful peninsula in the middle of a lake. And so um, it's just a beautiful campus. And um, I just fell in love with it the moment I came to campus um, way back in 2005, which seems like a million years ago to you. To me, it seems like yesterday. Um, but I... Um, after graduating, I went to Baylor and I got my PhD in history. And then um, I had the opportunity to come back and teach here. And um, just knowing the kind of community there is and the fact that you really get a chance to invest in students and really get to know them and um, create good deep relationships with students because I had had that experience with my faculty members. And so um, I jumped on the opportunity and I've been here for, this is my fourth year, um, my second year as the director of the Eagles Honors Program, Eagle Scholars Honors Program. <laughs> There's a lot of S's in there that I forget where they belong, but um, I'm also, yeah, the assistant professor of history um, and I have a few other colleagues in the history department as well. So thanks for the opportunity to get to speak today. But I'd like to meet you two, Eleanor and William really quick, um, since I know that you'll be chip um, speaking in a little bit later. So could you just briefly introduce yourselves? Yeah, so I'm William Atkinson. I am a junior in high school and live in Ennis, Texas, if you know where that is. And I've been classically educated all through of my education and have a deep interest in history, especially American and learning about the foundations of our current society and government specifically. And we'll look forward to hearing what you have to say tonight. Thank you very much. I'm Eleanor Story. I live in Maryland and go to St. Jerome Institute, which is a Catholic classical school. Um, and since I go to a classical school, I have a little bit of lack of history, so I'm trying to make up for that in every way I can. And I'm also very interested in American history, as that is a great part of the formation of who we are now. And I think it's really important to be able to understand who, what what we are in our country and as people. We're so glad you're both here. And I have to say, you both have excellent backgrounds, very good choices that you both made. Very scholarly <laughs> um, looking. Very scholarly. Yeah, I look forward to your questions and thoughts uh, later tonight. So Dr. Kelly, screen is yours. Thank you so okay. much. All right. So Ida B. Wells is a figure. I know that the CLT exam um, often focuses on philosophy and um, kind of really dense texts that you are extrapolating. And a lot of times these seminars are about 
really understanding the content of those texts. Um, but Ida B. Wells is a little bit of a different story. So she's a journalist. And one of the reasons that she's so important is because of what she did and what she was advocating for. Um, her writing was part of that work. Um, and so she would have been important even if she hadn't written what she wrote, unlike someone like, say, um, Julian of Norwich, right, which who is a fascinating figure, but if we didn't have her writings, we wouldn't really know who she was. But Ida B. Wells um, is important partly because of what she did and the time period that she was alive and that she worked in was a really complicated and um, in some ways very difficult time in American history. And so in order to really understand her and her work, we first have to understand sort of the time period that she is writing in and that she is working in. And so um, tonight we're going to have a little bit of a history lecture first. We're going to spend um, some time just learning about the historical context that she lived in um, and then her life. And then we'll talk and do some discussion of her um, work as well so that you can sort of be familiar for it familiar with it if it shows up in the exam. Um, we'll also talk about Northwestern a little bit, and I'm going to have my Eagle Scholars chime in if you guys ask me questions about it too, and so you can get maybe a feel for what some of the students think of our school. I, I saw on the list of students here, we have seniors and we have freshmen, so it's a great, um, a great assortment of students. So, all right, let's get started. So Ida B. Wells was born into slavery. But when she was really young, um, the Civil War came to an end and the Emancipation Proclamation was declared. And at first, it seemed like things were really going to change for Black Americans and freed slaves in the South. Um, there were three amendments to the Constitution that were passed during this period called Reconstruction. And the reason it's called Reconstruction is that they are literally having to reconstruct the South, right? So the South left um, the Union during um, prior to the Civil War, and um, it was decimated. It lost um, so many of its men, um, either via because they were soldiers or um, because they had been working as slaves and they were no longer required to work on the plantations. And so the economic system in the South was um, very, um, was, sorry, the, the economic system of, the system of the South was, there was a lot of problems created by the fact that a lot of the men were gone after the Civil War, but there was also a lot of physical damage because a lot of the war was actually fought in the South, right? So not only do you have um, people being displaced, but you also have things like Atlanta literally being burned to the ground or railroads being blown up. And so Reconstruction is partially a process of the Northern states trying to figure out what do we do about the South? And um, at first, it really seemed like things were going to change. Um, the 13th Amendment was passed, and that uh, abolished slavery in the United States, right? So that's really famous. And um, it was ratified in 18... Um, oh, my dates, uh, my notes, my PowerPoint got messed up. I apologize. It was ratified in 1861. 1861, that is not right. My note literally says 18651, which I'm pretty sure none of those numbers are right. So I'm not sure what happened in the process of copying and pasting from my notes to the PowerPoint. So I apologize. But um, unfortunately, uh, just abolishing slavery or abolishing servitude does not help figure out what to do with all of these people who were previously enslaved, right? So you have millions of people who were enslaved and now are free, but where do they fit into our political fit system? Where do they fit into our democracy? And so the 14th Amendment um, granted citizenship to all people who were either born or naturalized in the United States. Um, and it guaranteed equal protection of the laws and also due process of law for any um, citizen. And so that um, meant that slaves 
former slaves could be considered citizens, even if they were born in Africa and brought um, to the United States. Um, that's one of the reasons that the naturalization clause is in there. But that still didn't necessarily guarantee the right to vote. And so the 15th Amendment gives the right to vote to all male citizens. And it actually explicitly says, regardless of race or previous um, condition of servitude. And so at the very beginning of Reconstruction, you see this huge um, uptick in Black Americans Black men being able to vote. Um, and because of that, a lot of Black political leaders are put into place throughout the South to represent their constituents who are Black former slaves. Well, due to a very complicated process with the president, which I will not uh, go into in depth here because the point is to talk about Ida B. Wells, not Andrew Johnson. Um, these, um, these, Black voters and Black politicians were very threatening to many of the Southern leaders who were previous Confederate leaders um, during the Civil War. And so due to a lot, um, a lot of laws being passed, racism, racism continued to be prevalent in the South. Um, various states created what were called black codes. And these were laws that um, designated what previously enslaved people were allowed to do. Um, for instance, if you were allowed to, um, um, it, sorry, I am, it's the end of the day and I've been teaching all day. So I'm, I'm a little bit more frazzled than I usually am. Although my students will tell you, I'm usually a little bit frazzled. This is kind of me anyway, so that's okay. But, um, they are going to create very strict rules for Black people. For instance, um, Black men are not allowed to not have a job. If you do not have a job, you can get arrested and put in jail, and then you are able to be loaned out to anyone in the community who needs someone to work. And in many cases, the people that need someone to work are plantation owners or former slave owners. And so why would you hire Black Americans if you can just get them their work for free? And so it creates a cycle where you're still kind of stuck in slavery. There also is laws about um, whether Black people are able to meet together or whether Black people are allowed to be out at night. And so these things are going to really question, are these full citizens or not? And where do they fit into our society? Um, and during this time, you also have the rise of the KKK. And we're going to talk more about these things when we get to Ida. But um, this is happening in the South during the end of Reconstruction. You also have the legal structures of the Jim Crow South forming. Um, so Jim Crow is um, a system of laws that are going to say that people can be separate and still be equal, right? So you can have separate amenities for white people and for black people. We all have seen, um, we all know that this happened in history, right? You have black people have to sit at the back of the bus or um, you have separate drinking fountains for white and black Americans. Well, this was something that was really established in the late 19th century. And it was a couple of Supreme Court cases that are really going to put this into place. And this, um, so one of those is Plessy versus Ferguson, which um, said that a Louisiana law requiring different railroad cars for white people and black people was um, constitutional. So you can have separate cars and that is still equal. And then Cumming versus the County Board of Education um, a few years later says that it's okay to create separate schools for white kids, even if there are no equivalent schools for black students. And so this is going to this is going to create a system where you're not just separate, but it's okay for them to be separate and not equal, right? And so um, this is going to reinforce this idea that Black Americans are not as um, 
worthy of or are not equal participants in society and equal citizens to white Americans. And this is something that um, Ida B. Wells is really going to fight against and really going to um, be investigating. Um, so we'll get there in just a minute. <laughs> um, actually, I'll just pause. Do either of you have any questions so far? If you don't, that's okay. But I want to just like, if there's something that has already come up, I know by the so, time we're at the end, you won't remember this part anymore. So go ahead. Yes. Yes. Um, the Jim Crow laws, mm -hmm. they are, are they an unofficial or an official set of laws? Because it, what it seems like from what you're saying is it's kind of this um, understated code. Mm -hmm. where these laws are being put in place, but they're not really explicit on what they're actually doing. What they're actually doing is separating by race people mm -hmm. into different institutions such as schools and rail cars, et cetera. Yes. But it seems like the Supreme Court is merely supporting that uh, implicitly by siding with the people who are trying to make these laws, not necessarily um, supporting them on a federal level or creating any federal policies. Is that is that the case? OK, so that's a great question. So they are um, the Supreme Court is not making these rules on a federal level, but they are allowing states to do it. And so this is very much tied into the idea of states rights. And they're saying that states in America have the right to make these laws. Um, so they are actually establishing them as official laws, but it's not something that is nationwide. Um, so. But the thing is that the Constitution is nationwide, right? So the amendments that were passed during the Re Reconstruction saying that all natural born citizens are full citizens of the United States, that is a national law. And um, many people later in the civil rights movement are going to argue that these Jim Crow laws undermine those constitutional laws. And so essentially Jim Crow is allowing states to disregard the constitution in order to put these laws in place. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. That's a great question. Yeah. Also, Eleanor? so I know you said that the government in the South, there was a complicated situation with the president and it somehow yes. ended up <laughs> that people were in charge who maybe should not have been in charge. How yes. did we end up, since the Supreme Court is on a national level, how yes. did that end up being so biased if it seems like the union was obviously trying to reconstruct the south and mm -hmm. yeah great question so in the so just because people are northerners didn't mean that they necessarily um didn't mean that they necessarily avoided ideas about white supremacy or that black people were not equal, right? So there's a lot of people who are sympathetic to the ideas of the South, even if they think the Confederacy was bad, like you shouldn't have left the union, you shouldn't have fought us in a civil war, but we understand that you guys have a problem with African-American people that we don't have in the North. And so a lot of the Supreme Court justices, there are some Southern Supreme Court justices, but there's also Northern Supreme Court justices that agree with the racial ideas of the South. So that's a fantastic question too. Can you um, briefly explain the, the root of the term Jim Crow, where that came from? Well, oh, I knew as soon as I said Jim Crow laws, I'm like, these students are really smart and they're gonna ask me that question and I can't remember. I, oh, where did it come from? It's in my head, but it's not coming out. If anyone in the chat knows, please feel free to chip in. Um, but I don't remember off the top of my head. I'm so sorry. Um, I don't remember why. Yes, yeah, several of you have asked this question. I don't remember why it's called Jim Crow. Well, feel free to Google and then jump into the chat because I'd like to remember myself. Um, an actor who frequently did... Blackface. Okay. That makes sense. Thanks, Kira. All right. So this is going to continue to snowball. So if you, if you notice the years of Plessy versus Ferguson and, um, for some reason, my animations only seem to work going backwards. I'm trying to go back to the previous slide for just a minute. Go back. Thank you. All right. The, um, the, Two laws were passed in 1896 and in 1899. But a lot of this, um, 
unrest in the South is going to peak during the 1910s and 1920s. Um, and this is during a period called the New South. Um, so there is this idea after the Civil War called the Lost Cause. And what this is, is the idea that Confederate, um, Confederate soldiers and Confederate politicians had a very noble thing that they were fighting for. And the noble thing they were fighting for was um, sort of the ideals of the South, um, the ideals of loyalty to your family, um, of chivalry, and of white supremacy. And they're very explicit about this. This is not something that they're trying to hide in any way. And so groups like the United Daughters of the Confederacy, and the Confederate veterans are going to start actively talking about this idea of, um, you know, the war of Northern aggression rather than the Civil War, or the idea that um, the, the South is something that is worth preserving. Like this, those Southern ideas of antebellum America when slavery was still part of the structure of the South. They're gonna build a lot of Confederate monuments during this time. They're gonna build statues of Confederate generals and Confederate figures. And most of those statues are actually built in the 1920s. Um, and this is going to be a nationwide thing. This is not just in the South. So for instance, in 1905, um, a man named Thomas F. Dixon in South Carolina, or North Carolina, sorry, published a novel called The Klansman. And this novel basically said that the KKK are heroic defenders of the South, um, that the real problem in the South is Northerners who are coming to try to um, misrule the South after the Civil War and African Americans and that the KKK, they're really defenders of this lost cause. And then in 1915, there was a movie made based on this novel called The Birth of a Nation. Um, and just to give you an idea of how this is like a really nationwide thing, um, this movie, which um, reinforced all those ideas that the KKK is defending white women against black men, um, that they are defending the South versus the North. It becomes a national cultural phenomenon. Um, people in Chicago are having parties where they are dressing in white Klan robes. In New York, there's Klan themed balls. And this is actually the first movie ever shown at the White House by Woodrow Wilson. Um, and like the first movie ever shown at the White House and Woodrow Wilson was the one to show it. Um, and so this is a nationwide um, sort of way of remembering the Civil War and remembering the South in a way that isn't really historically accurate based on what was really happening. One of the reasons that this is occurring is because there are a lot of lynchings happening in America. And this is where things are going to be a little bit heavy. Um, I mean, it's already heavy what we're talking about, but um, I'm not going to show anything particularly graphic. Well, nothing like horrible, but nothing absurdly horrible. I don't know how to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to show anything that's going to make you like have nightmares. <laughs> that's, there we go. Um, um, but there are a large widespread um, number of lynchings happening in all over the United States, including in Duluth, Minnesota, including in the West, um, but especially in the Deep South. Um, between 1889 and 1899, an average of about 187 um, Black people were lynched every year in the United States. This directly relates to Ida B. Wells, by the way. This is why I'm talking about this. Um, over 4,000 victims um, of lynching that we know of for sure. And usually what lynching was is that um, someone would be accused of a petty crime, um, say whistling at a white woman or stealing a you know, candy bar. And then they would go to jail and before there's able to be a trial or after the trial had determined that they're innocent, um, a, white, um, a group of white people will come and actually take them out of the jail and kill them um, in public. Um, and one of the really hard parts about this is that these are 
events where hundreds and hundreds of people come to watch. Um, and it's also things that prominent white Southerners are openly affirming. Um, there was a Georgia newspaper columnist and a woman's rights activist. Her name is Rebecca Felton. Um, she becomes the first woman to serve in the U.S. Senate. Um, she said, if it takes lynching to protect, protect women's dearest possession from drunken ravening beasts, then I say lynch a thousand a week. Or the governor of South Carolina said, whenever the Constitution comes between me and the virtue of the white women of South Carolina, I say to hell with the Constitution. And the thing about lynching is it's not just murder, which is what it which it was, but it was also something that had a lot of symbolism to it. Um, they would purposely treat the people being lynched and the bodies of the people being lynched in such a way as to dehumanize them as much as possible. Um, and there, like I said, there was also literally crowds of thousands of people would come um, to watch um, these lynchings and they would sell photographs and they would sell postcards that you could send to your fa family afterwards to brag about being there. Um, and this happens in places like Waco, Texas and Duluth, Minnesota and all over the rest of the country. And so where Ida B. Wells really comes in is she's going to step in and begin to report on what's really happening with these lynchings across the country. Um, but before I sort of go into her, I wanna pause again. If there's any questions, and I am keeping an eye on the chat too, if there's any questions on the chat, or any questions from my panelists, um, you don't have to ask questions. So please don't feel like, oh my goodness, every time she stops, I have to think of a question. But if you have one, I want to make sure you have the option to ask it. So, so you said um, that this started to happen, um, especially like the lost cause, the 1910s and 20s. Yes. But the Civil War ended in 1960 or 1865. Yes, correct. So why did it take so long to kind of reverse from where they're going yeah. the South kind of immediately push back? That's a great question. So this, um, the peak of the lost cause was in the 1920s, but lynching starts really in the like 1880s. Um, so maybe about 15 years after the Civil War. Um, it really starts after official reconstruction ends. So reconstruction is also like a series of policies that are put into place and leaders in the South were trying to get readmitted to the union. Like each state had to kind of prove that they were going to be good and that they weren't going to cause another civil war and like leave again as soon as they get back in, right? And one of the ways they had to do that is they had to affirm the new amendments. Um, and so it takes a while before the um, people that are in power in the South are going to allow these things to occur. And what, what I mean by that is at many, many lynchings, there's going to be like the mayor and the sheriff of the town are there, like present watching. Um, one of the ways that happens is, remember how I said during Reconstruction that at first there was a lot of Black voters that were able to vote like Black representatives in? Well, as the North starts to sort of lessen the Reconstruction laws, um, a bunch of new things are put into place to try to keep Black people from voting. Things like literacy tests and poll taxes and a grandfather clause, which means that if your grandfather wasn't able to vote, then you can't vote, which if your grandfather was a slave, then you can't vote. Well, now I can't vote. That means my grandchild's not going to be able to vote, right? So you create this system where you're not explicitly saying Black people can't vote, but you're also the only people running the courthouse are white. So if I come in to register to vote and I'm white, my white people at the courthouse are gonna let me in and they're not going to let a black person in. So there's all these reasons that black voting drops off like 90% between 1865 and 1890. That means that the people that are getting elected in the South are not the people that the black community wants to be elected. And so that really sets the stage for these things to come into play. 
That's a great question, Eleanor. Yeah. Also, was there any um, pushback against the joining back up of the South to the North? Like, were there people who said we're actually our own country or mm. still wanted to secede? Fantastic question. Um, they not openly because the benefit, once you are fully decimated by the war, um, they realize they aren't going to be able to govern or be able to um, rebuild the South on their own. And so there's a lot of incentive to want the North to help them. Like, let's say you stay separate and then all of a sudden somebody invades the South, like a foreign power invades the South. Well, now we have no army to defend ourselves, right? So like you really, there's a lot of reasons that after the Civil War is over, practical reasons that rejoining with the North is beneficial um, to Southerners. But there remains this idea of, but we're only doing this because we have to. The South is still really, really noble. And those ideas that are under the surface, and I'm not saying for the, I just want to be very clear. I'm not saying that like everything about the South is terrible. No, 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 no. But this idea that the, um, this idea that slavery as a system was not necessarily the problem, that is going to be something that they're going to keep repeating and kind of convince themselves of and convince some Northerners of as well after the war is over. Yeah. Great question. So uh, what, what you you mentioned that some people are calling it the war of northern aggression instead yeah. of the civil war. What yeah. is kind of the leading factor and maybe proponent in that movement during this time? Yeah. So if the South was a noble cause that was lost, then we must not have lost because we committed treason and left the country and attacked you guys. It really must be that the North try to take us over, right? So it's a very clear rewriting of history in order to remember the Confederacy as like a noble thing. Yeah. So Ida B. Wells steps in. Who is she? Who is she? She's why we're here. So let's talk about her. <laughs> um, and I think you'll understand why I just did all of that other stuff once we start talking about her. So she, oh, Sorry, I meant to talk about her a little bit more on this slide. So she was actually born into slavery in Mississippi um, in 1862. So the very middle of the Civil War. And um, she is freed by the Emancipation Proclamation. And at the age of 14, she loses her parents and her brother in the 1878 yellow fever epidemic. So she is an orphan and she is gonna to go to work to keep the rest of her family together. And it was very common in the South for black women to work outside the home, um, much more common than for white women because of the lack of economic opportunities for black men. So white women, black women, women were working outside the home a lot, but even for a 14 year old, it's a lot to keep a family together, right? So she later moves some of her siblings to Memphis, Tennessee, where she becomes a teacher. Um, she is going to co-own and write a newspaper called the Memphis Free Speech and Headlight Newspaper. And she is going to use this newspaper to talk about issues of inequality and racial segregation. And so she's gonna start being an activist through this newspaper that she writes for. Um, one of her earliest moments of activism happens in 1884. Um, she is on a train and um, it is a train on the Chesapeake, Ohio and Southwestern Railroad. So if you notice the primary source that we have here, um, this is related to this case. And she is in a first class ladies car and the train conductor tells her that she has to leave that car and move. And if this sounds like Rosa Parks um, about 60 years earlier, that's because it is. <laughs> um, what Rosa Parks was doing was something that people had been doing for a long time. Um, so she is going to refuse to give up her seat and she is dragged out of the car, the uh, railroad car. Um, and she writes a newspaper article for a black church newspaper about her treatment on the train. 
Um, and then she hires an attorney, an African-American attorney to sue the railroad. Um, and she ends up winning her case. Um, she is granted uh, $500, which at the time, which today would be about $16,000. So, you know, pretty, pretty good money. Um, and then the railroad company appeals to the Tennessee Supreme Court who reverse the lower court's ruling. Um, and so actually the courts end up backing up the railroad rather than her in the long run. And um, after this happened, this is the original um, decision made, but um, Ida says, I feel so, I felt so disappointed because I had hoped such great things from my sweet, for my suit, for my people. Oh God, is there no justice in this land for us? Um, she is going to become more and more interested in advocating yeah. for um, for civil rights. And um, then she witch witnesses a lynching. She witnesses a lynching of four of her friends um, in Tennessee. And that is going to really give her sort of her, um, what she is known for the most. So she is going to begin to investigate incidents of lynching all over the country. So she travels around the country and um, actually investigates the reasons that people are lynching and then publishes these two important works. They're both short. Their um, lynch law in all its phases is less than 20 pages. A red record um, is kind of like a deeper version of lynch law in all its phases. And that's about a hundred pages. Um, but what they're going to do is they are, go she's going to basically tell everyone around the country what is happening in the South. This is what's happening. The, this is the explicit detail of all of these events. And this is what people are saying is happening. Um, and we're going to read a little bit from this first work um, in just a couple minutes. Um, so I'm not going to go into detail about what it says because I don't want to spoil the discussion and I am paying attention to the time as well. Um, but she is also then going to move on from the activism against lynching to become a suffragette. Um, she's going to argue that um, Black women if they were allowed to vote, would be able to combat lynching in the South. And so she very much ties the idea of women voting um, with this desire to end lynching. Um, she says that um, white women are not speaking up for these Black men, but Black women could. And so um, she's going to really tie those ideas together as she works for the women's right to vote. And then she is also going to co be a co-founder of um, the NAACP, which is a very important activist group um, for people of color, especially um, in this period with Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois. And I love this picture because it is in St. Paul. So um, it's right, it's near Northwestern. Um, these important figures gathered um, to meet together to begin to work through official political um, activism to try to get equality. Eventually, my lecture's almost over here. Eventually, um, IDB Wells is actually going to try to be a political candidate herself. Um, she wants to be a delegate to the Republican National Convention, which at the time the Republican Party and the Democratic Party didn't, you can't map like the ideals of the parties from the 1920s onto the ideals of the parties today. Um, they just don't, it's just, it was a different time and they had different things that they were concerned about. But she wanted to be able to go and be an official voter for who would be president, who would be the Republican candidate for president. She eventually does not get elected to go. Um, and she has a couple other efforts to enter politics officially, which she does not, um, is not successful. But she is going to um, be known for all of this activism, um, political um, suffrage, and the civil rights activism against lynching. So um, let's read a little bit of her work here. And my screen is going to go wonky for just a second while I copy and paste the link into the chat. 
Um, so this is a small, you start, whoa, hot corners. Okay. Um, this is a short excerpt um, from Lynch Law in America. Um, it is about four paragraphs. Um, and so I'm going to give you, you know, five or six minutes to read through this. Um, everyone can do it. I put it in the, um, um, oh yeah, good. And then Natalie gave it to everybody. Um, so please feel free, please read this and then be thinking about what is she, what I want you to think about as you're reading it is what is she arguing that people claim is the reason for lynching and how does she dispute that claim? Okay, so what do people say is the reason for lynching and what does she say is really the reason for lynching? Okay, have fun, read for five minutes and I'll stand here awkwardly and stare at the screen or stare at Natalie. There's a question in the q and I wanted to ask you before we resume. Um, yeah. As we're reading her really amazing prose, um, Abigail asks where Ida B. Wells learned how to read and write and when. Yeah, I know. That's a great question. Um, she um, was educated in the South in schools that were put in place by um, the Reconstruction. So during Reconstruction, there were um, a lot of schools for Black children put into place by um, a group that, or a, yeah, 
a group known as the Freedmen's Bureau. Um, eventually, the Freedmen's Bureau was sort of dismantled, and so a lot of those schools did not survive, but that is where she learned. So, great question. And just so you know, Eagle Scholars, I wrote down who is here, so you don't have to worry about attendance <laughs> while everyone's finishing reading. <laughs> I know who you are. Okay, well, yeah, so let's talk about it. What do you, and I, I know Eleanor and William are going to be my representatives here. So Will, William and Eleanor, what do you think she is arguing that people claim is the reason for lynching? Well, it's uh, very clear to me that she's saying that the claim is that there is a consistency of the rape of white women by black men and that this uh, so-called injustice, which if it were true, would be obviously a, a terrible travesty, uh, leads to the instigation of the lynchings. And and they believe, the, the culture believes that it is so, so great um, a travesty so as to celebrate and almost worship as if it's some idol, this, this um, martyred man who has, in most cases, she says two thirds has done no wrong, mm -hmm. simply becomes the victim of a frenzied mob, which mm -hmm. in this case is, is essentially become the government, the judge, jury and executioner, this mob of democratic voters who have collectively voted that this single person should be brutally murdered. That's exactly right. Good. Yeah. And so why do you think, um, why do you think people in the South were so quick to assume that black men were raping white women like this? And either of you could answer. Yeah. Go ahead. Me, it seems like there might have been um, kind of an underlying disgruntledness about the occupants being forced to, by the reconstruction laws, to sort of move over and make way for these new people who need a home now. And okay. this is an outlet that they perceive as a way to to fight back against that and to try and, in the bitterness of their heart, put the black man where he so-called belongs, right? And the horrors and tragedies are expressive of the incapability of the cultures to mix easily. Okay. What do you think, Eleanor? Yeah, I think part of it, it's, yeah, the incapability of the cultures to mix easily. And also kind of a fear of people who are different than yourself on both sides and it just leads to more and more conflict and kind of a fear of anyone that either looks different than you or thinks differently than you. Yeah, so during slavery, when slavery is a system, um, one of the ways that they, the South, the Southern culture, um, and this happens in anywhere that you have um, people who are treated as if they are not human. Um, there was this idea that Black men were dangerous or that they um, were less moral, and that's why they were justified in being enslaved. Um, and there's all this kind of pseudoscience that grows up during the late, um, during the 19th century that is really going to reinforce these ideas. And it's not good science, like it's not based on actual evidence, but it reinforces this idea that Black people are more animalistic and let, have um, less ability to control themselves. And so these stereotypes are really going to feed into um, this idea that the white woman who is kind of the supposed to be the most virtuous um, is threatened by these black men who now are no longer being protected by slavery. They're now out running amok, right? And so it reinforces this idea that they can't be trusted. We can't let them vote. 
they aren't moral. We can't let them have power in our communities. We can't let them have leadership in our communities. They can't control themselves. And so it's a perpetuation of these ideas that were meant to kind of keep slavery in place. And now that slavery is gone, they're reinforcing these racist ideas um, in the South outside of the structure of slavery through lynching. Um, so what does she say is, or I guess what other observations do you have or what other questions do you have about the reading or about Ida B. Wells in general? I noticed uh, throughout the reading how she's kind of comparing it to the Passion of Christ, specifically mm. one line. She says, the officers of the law delivered the prisoner to the mob. That just mm -hmm. seems so clear to me. It's like, I'm yeah, over to the people. Yeah, fantastic. Why do you think she would do that? Why would she make an, like make that connection? Obviously to try to, you know, make uh make it very clear that those who are being lynched are innocent and okay. just punished. Good. Why else do you think? I think there's probably another layer to that too. I think you're absolutely right. But and I think that the mob is wrong. And okay, good. Even that the mob will at some point turn around and see that they were wrong. Aha. Yes, because another thing that the South is and a part of the lost cause is that the South are the ones that own true Christianity and protect Christianity, right? And so you want to try to build empathy with white people who are Christians. And so saying these are innocent people, just like Christ, right, are is a way of maybe helping. And that was a big reason that she published these works is to help these um white people who aren't sympathetic to the plight of what's going on start to get their emotions involved and start to care. And so that is, yeah, really good observation. Fantastic. What else? Uh, I had one question from yeah. earlier, yeah. specifically about Ida B. Wells, yeah. how her, um, kind of business aspect got started because you mentioned that she she founded and uh, co-founded a newspaper which yeah. is very interesting to me because that seems like kind of an unlikely path for her to be able to take at that point yeah absolutely so she's working as a teacher and she is um she is the co-owner of the newspaper and so she is I mean we're not talking about like the New York Times right like we're talking about a local newspaper but one thing I didn't mention is that after she comes out about the railroad um, and after she comes out about that local lynching that she had witnessed, um, people are actually going to burn down the newspaper offices and destroy um, her business in protest for her speaking out about against those things. Um, but you're right. It's very unusual for a black woman to um, sort of own a business in Memphis, Tennessee. And um, that is one of the reasons that she's remarkable. <laughs> um, and so she, it's a, because it, it she co-owns it with other, with other black um, citizens. So, yeah. And uh, you mentioned that she was educated in the South. Once she began to teach, did she continue her own education or did she uh, kind of cease that? She was not college educated. Um, so she, um, yeah, she, oh, wait, let me double check that fact. Cause I just second guess myself. I, sorry, I'm not, unfortunately, I'm not the Ida B. Wells expert in terms of like, this isn't what my personal research is about. So I I'm doing it to help y'all and because I wanted to learn more too but I don't know all the details necessarily oh she did she went to Fisk University so yes she did continue her education later sorry about that that was incorrect oh I also we're supposed to be talking about Northwestern so also if anyone has any questions about Northwestern please um in the Q&A or you guys feel free to jump in now too because I know we're running out of time yeah it was only a few minutes left I, I wanted to ask you yeah. for our students or for anyone on the call um further reading about reconstruction or Ida specifically or, or her peers um do you have any recommendations yeah so um um the souls of black folk um by um W.E.B. Du Bois and um 
Up From Slavery by uh, Booker T. Washington are two of the kind of the classics. Um, but I would also just recommend picking up a, uh, like a good um, history book. Um, Eric Foner, F-O-N-E-R, is sort of the most respected um, Reconstruction historian. And I just think it's a period of time that's really worth reading about. If you want to read something that's a little bit more fun, but still history, there's a book called Confederates in the Attic. Attic, not attic. <laughs> um, and it is a, um, a man who travels around the Deep South, um, like meeting people who believe in the lost cause. And he like goes and does like a civil war reenactment and then like goes and hangs out with the daughters of the confederation of the Confederacy. And it's really, really fascinating. He's super empathetic, um, but it's just a great way to kind of encounter these ideas in a way that's maybe a little bit less academic. So yeah, those are some recommendations I'd make. And then uh, one more question about yeah. Uh, well, I guess moving on to Northwestern, what is yeah. your favorite class to teach? Mm, my favorite class to teach is, well, I have two. The um, History of American Religion is really fun, um, but I just got to teach um, American Revolution and Early Republic, and that class is a blast. Um, we have debates, so each of the students is assigned a role. So like you are a merchant from, um, you know, Boston, and you are a slaveholder from Virginia, and you are a Quaker from Pennsylvania, and we all are going to debate whether or not the U.S. should get involved in the French Revolution. And we have root beer um, and meet in our pretend pub. And um, it is very fun. And that is a really fun class to teach. Christian Watkins, who's in the chat, was part of that. So um, he, he knows. Yeah. Curious That's what you funny. think. We talked about how the South was building monuments. This was a while ago, but the South was building yeah. monuments with Confederate generals. Yes. Um, what do you think is the proper way to remember? Because mm -hmm. I don't think just trying to shove the history out of the way is right. Original. Yeah. So this is obviously a really complex question, and it's going to differ depending on the statue, depending on who you're talking to. Um, so I think there's a difference between remembering history and like honoring something that happened in the past in terms of like making it something that is praiseworthy. Um, and a lot of monuments are built as ways of like praising someone. You build someone, you build a monument to someone because there's someone that we want to remember as a hero, right? And so how do we deal with statues that were made of people that maybe aren't um, as heroic, but that are very prominent and we don't want to erase the history, but we also don't want to continue to reinforce this idea that um, the Confederacy is good. So I think that, so Baylor University, which is where I went to graduate school, did, um, ha it's the oldest, longest running university in Texas. And so um, several of the founders owned slaves, including Judge Baylor, which is who the university is built named after. Um, and so what they did is instead of like removing all the statues, they added um, they added some statues to commemorate other people who are maybe less um, remembered, like the first black graduates of Baylor. But then they also added plaques to a lot of the statues that like kind of tell more of a complex story about the reality of who the person is so that when you go to the judge baylor statue like it's still there but it is it like you can really read the full story of who he was and what he did and he did some great things and he did some not great things which is exactly what if you put a statue of me up there that's what you would get too um but i do think some statues maybe don't need to be in as places of prominence as they are, but um, I don't think that you need to tear them all down either. So hopefully that answers. Not, sort of not to paint pictures in either black or white and yeah, all bad or all good. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that's, cause we're humans. No humans are all bad or all good. There's some that are more of one or the other. <laughs> right. So like, you're not going to find me defending Hitler anytime soon, but I think that, um, creating places to remember the slaves and remember the people that were enslaved by 
um, them is one way that you can kind of balance out those stories in public history. And we do have a public history minor here at Northwestern too. Um, if you're interested in museums or archives or anything like that, we um, we have that as well. And that is an awesome opportunity. The Twin Cities, Minnesota has the largest historical society in the country. So there's a ton of internship and um, just a lot of really cool history things here. So, yeah. That's great. Thank you for, for making this space for remembrance like that tonight. It's been... Yeah learned a lot and thank you to the students for your excellent questions all the way along. Fantastic questions. You guys are both, if you, if you, I know that Minnesota is a long way from Maryland or from Texas, but if you decide to journey up, um, can I just quickly say, if you are an Eagle Scholar in the chat, um, put like a couple words of like, what do you love about Northwestern? Like, why did you choose Northwestern or what has your experience been like? If you're still here, I think you are, um, just quickly in, or is it in the Q&A or in the chat? I don't know. I don't quite understand how this works right now. Yeah, uh, probably in the chat and okay. to make sure it's to everyone rather than just, just us. Yeah, community. It was so impressive at the beginning, seeing the variety of majors and imagining them all in a classroom together, having these conversations. That's great. Community all the way down so far. Mm -hmm. And a beautiful campus. Oh. Yes, we do have canoes and fishing and an island and turtles. So, you know, turtles are a big draw. <laughs> Community campus, yeah. School of business. Yeah, we have a great school of business as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So thanks for letting me brag a little bit. But I love, I love Northwestern. Um, it's just a fantastic place to be. So, yeah. Yeah, definitely. When it comes to reading, you want a beautiful place and you want a good community. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Beautiful trees. Right now the trees are all changing. So it's just absolutely gorgeous. It's perfect weather. So yeah. You make me want to go back to college. <laughs> yes, Katie, I want to go back to college too, because there was a lot less grading when I was a college student. So <laughs> Well, thank you so much for having me and thank you for listening. And, um, you know, if anyone in the chat that's not a Northwestern student wants to reach out, um, my email is on the Eagle Scholar website, but also on the history website. So feel free to reach out to me personally or to our admissions office if you're interested. And thank you, Eagle Scholars, for participating as well. It was great to have you here. And I have all your names, although I don't know who Jazz is. So someone keeps saying they're Jazz and I don't know who that is. So you should email me, okay? <laughs> All right. Thank you all so much. It was so nice to meet you, Eleanor and William. Thank you.